thank you for having me. And I hope some days that I'll be enjoying barbecue in person with you guys at this event instead of just doing this virtually. I am Grace Francisco. I am from San Francisco. And I'll tell you the joke about this a little bit later. <laughs> I did start off my career quite some time ago when I was a developer for Lotus Approach, which is a very popular desktop database at IBM way back when. And this was during an era where much of the web was actually static. And what I did there was to actually take our Windows-based approach forms and reports and to, uh, to make them dynamically available on the web. Not an easy feat back then when everything was static and we were just in the early days of having these connectors to things like DB2 so that we could render dynamic data. Um, but those were fun days in the early days of the internet uh, where also um, we would joke about the idea of ever buying anything off the internet, by the way. Uh, I progressed my career, I went through, through a variety of startups and eventually landed at Microsoft for my first job in uh, developer relations. We were called evangelists back then. We were developer evangelists, and I was the first developer evangelist for Microsoft's enterprise tool suite, developer tool suite, which was called uh, Visual Studio Team System back then. I went on from Microsoft. I spent a good eight years there learning the ropes of developer relations and went to lead developer relations at a variety of different organizations from uh, small business uh, arenas, uh, fintech, consumer, gaming. Uh, so I've had the honor and privilege of working for some really remarkable and amazing companies. But today, I am Grace Francisco from Cisco. <laughs> yes, for real. Um, and uh, yes, that is that it was just meant to be. Grace Francisco of Cisco from San Francisco. So you know, a little bit of a tongue twister, but at least it's memorable. So for those of you who might be familiar with the Cisco company name, you're probably thinking this. Right, network hardware, switches, routers, and, and I, I can understand that. That was where we our roots are from. That's where a lot of our success was uh, once upon a time. But did you know, if I can get my slide to go next, uh, my remote's not cooperating. Did you know that Cisco is actually the fifth largest software, software, yes, software company. We are a software company. And we actually are a participating member of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And we have hybrid cloud offerings at Cisco. And my role is to head up DevNet, which is our developer relations program at Cisco. And we have over 500,000 developers in our community to date. Now, I love this. I actually really, truly grew up with this thing that some of you may have only seen in a museum, sadly for me. I have fond memories of fighting over this rotary phone with my sister because you only really had one phone in the house. And if you had to call several numbers in a day, you got a real workout with that finger of yours. And then also, you know, if you were fighting with your sibling, that was another set of things you had to deal with. Uh, but today, my kids, they each have their own phones. And they're not just calling people. In fact, they rarely use it to call people, right? Because they're texting, they're watching videos, they're playing games. It does so much more than call someone. Um, and, you know, it, it, there was a challenge only a few years ago where a father challenged his son and his son's friend, who were, I think, 16 at the time, to figure out how to actually dial out on this kind of phone. Uh, needless to say, after five minutes, they weren't able to accomplish this challenge. Um, and I promise you, you don't really want to have to do this with the rotary form. It really is quite a workout with your finger. And yet today, technology is not just in our phones, it's absolutely everywhere. It's in our cars, it's in our doorbells, it's in our refrigerators. And in fact, a friend of mine was giving me a demo of his toast, his smart, very smart toaster oven, where you would put something in and it would identify the, the thing, the piece of meat or the egg, wherever you stuck in that oven, and it would figure out how to cook it for you automatically. Um, and I know many of you are also wearing smartwatches to track your fitness. It's simply everywhere. And yet, <clears throat> thank goodness for that, right? Because of last year, uh, we were, I felt like we were living in an alternate dimension, didn't it? Um, and for 
the beginning of that pandemic, I still remember, I know many people felt this way, that it felt like we were like suddenly like pausing and, and stopping in time with the, the beginning of this pandemic. Everything was shutting down. The streets were eerily quiet. The airport was a ghost town. And many of us, I will admit, um, went, you know, resorted to binge watching just to somehow have some familiarity of relating to what was once our society of of you know connecting and meeting coffee shops and going out to restaurants and to you know find some sense of meaning in all the craziness that was 2020. Uh, that is of course binge watching between all the online meetings that many of us I know have been doing all morning all day all night long or over walking our dogs yes I'm guilty and baking all the things when we've overstocked on things like flour and toilet paper and top ramen. Um, and the world has changed really, truly forever. So while we're starting to come up and out from this pandemic, uh, it has definitely left an indelible mark on the world. Um, a little over a year and a half ago, the pandemic, part of the pandemic, we were thinking about, you know, trade wars and tariffs. We were talking about the effects of macroeconomic pressures and geopolitical challenges. And yet now, looking back in this year and a half of, of a pandemic, those felt kind of small compared to what we've been through. And it really truly has touched everything that we do in every part of the world. Many companies weren't really prepared for the rapid, really rapid shift everyone had to move to that was imposed by the pandemic shutting so much down. I'm sure you all remember what it must have felt like or in where you were at the very be beginning of the pandemic. For me, I was actually at the very beginning of a, a massive um, move for my family just by sheer coincidence. Um, and that I will never forget. Uh, and these are memories that are forever burnt in your brain. Uh, strangely, in tech, while things felt like we paused for a bit, recruiting really did not slow. In fact, it was super competitive right in the middle of the pandemic to get really great technical talent. And I suspect a lot of that was the incredible demand um, for people who understood how to work in the cloud as so many businesses suddenly had to shift what they were doing in person to a cloud workload. Um, and you think about it, that it was to help ensure that we were now in a touchless environment that was accessible by our peers and colleagues who we needed to collaborate with. So there are some industries that were just well prepared and really well oriented for this really weird year and a half that we've had with the pandemic. And if I look back on it, telehealth, telehealth I, I barely thought about, right? I, I might have used it once in a year at most, where you you know call your doctor, they call you back, and that counted as telehealth. Well, telehealth really came a long way last year. It included video in many cases, and that was the default. That was the default that many of us had to go to. So I had many telehealth appointments either for myself or for my children or my husband. Um, and gaming, gaming, thank goodness for gaming. Thank goodness for my old company that I used, for, uh, used to work for Roblox, because there helped, there, the, this, Ro this Roblox community, these other gaming platforms helped us to have that social fabric that we so deeply desired to have in person. It gave us an entertainment, an entertainment platform to connect with our friends and family uh, in, a, in, a, in an entertaining way and to have these shared experiences in these virtual worlds. Uh, interestingly enough, at the very be beginning of the pandemic, the thing that was highlighted the most was actually the MOOCs. So these massive open online courses that were offered were slated for near death at the beginning of the pandemic, just before it hit. And yet that was the, one of the things that skyrocketed out of control and out, you know, was just scaling back up. It was resuscitated because of the pandemic, clearly because there was a deep desire by many of us who wanted to reskill and be able to afford the opportunity of the, the virtual work environment that us, those of us who are fortunate to be in tech had uh, at the very beginning. And then of course, we all shifted our shopping practices to online and digital. And Amazon obviously was one of the, the you know, biggest companies that profited from this uh, experience. And I know I had multiple boxes of, of Amazon deliveries 
every single week, if not every day, as we were not going out and not shopping in person. Uh, but they were prepared. And so these are some of the examples of interseason scenarios in which that scale up happened immediately and was able to, were able to really uh, support this rise in need during the pandemic. So now we're in this almost normal year where many of us have gotten vaccinated and numbers are coming down. But the truth is, things will never be truly back to normal as they were pre-pandemic days. The future of work is going to remain hybrid for a variety of reasons. And in fact, um, you know, while we were having we were having early signs of hope last year, at the end of last year, many companies were surveying their employees to understand their needs and desires of coming back to a real office workspace and to help inform them of that return to real world work. But the reality is, you know, some surveys have shown that 58% of workers will want to be working from home eight or more days each month. And that 98% of all meetings will actually include participants somewhere joining from home. And, you know, it, it's, I'm sure not a surprise that 77% of really large organizations are increasing that work flexibility, especially for those who are global companies, and shrinking some of their office sizes, re recognizing the deep desire for so many employees to continue with that flexibility to work from home. And you know, one interesting area in the middle of the pandemic was uh, seeing that some software teams who are so used to that in-person component of code reviews and looking over a colleague's shoulder to help out with some coding and, and reviews, um, it was hard to do in the middle of the pandemic if that's the way that you operated with your pull requests and your code reviews and, and, and pairing together uh, your insights for you know, how, to, how to build things. But you know, fortunately, with all of the plugins and integrations that are available, the um, the messaging tools, the version control tools across the board that were so um, widely available in SaaS already, it really required just a little bit of glue in between to make sure that there was a fabric there to help create that conversation and keep the effect of that conversation through the code that's cited, through the pull request that's put in. And so interesting uh, experiences cropped up that were actually pre-pandemic, but I'm sure had a ton of lift and adoptions. An open source project called CodeStream actually creates that flow between these tools and streamlines it so that um, as you are messaging someone and asking for a code review, you can organize the code review with your teammates and then document seamlessly the conversation that's happening so that you have that preserved institutional knowledge as you're working through and encoding and, um, and building your applications. So there was actually a true benefit in shifting all of this online because that virtual collaboration really captured and documenting documented all of these things that would otherwise be just between two people and you would lose that uh, transparency and the color and context of those changes. But now it's there because it was forcibly required in this new virtual world that we've all been operating in. And cloud engineering has really significantly accelerated. In fact, it was front and center in the middle of uh, the pandemic. And it, ha it ha was a growing practice prior to that, but really um, having the, this discipline front and center during the pandemic was, was huge in terms of really shifting some of the ways that we're actually organized and working together between application developers and operations. So to support remote work, um, this dramatic need really caused businesses to scramble. And you know, in that early part of the pandemic, uh, they were looking to enable their entire team to do their work, whether it was the ops team and the infrastructure that they were managing or the app developers needing to work together and deploy their code. So, you know, of course the focus was minimizing as much of that on-prem scenario and the, the touching in the environment on, in an on-prem situation um, and really enabling that collaboration from a really virtual perspective. 
So in 2022, IDC expects that over 90% of enterprises worldwide will be relying on a mix of on-prem dedicated private clouds and multi-cloud multi environments uh, to meet those infrastructure needs uh, well beyond uh, this pandemic. So we, I, I introduced the concept of cloud engineering, but what do I, what do I really mean by this thing called cloud engineering? And for, it shouldn't mean DevOps 2.0, which to some degree was really developers throwing things over the wall to ops and ops still having to, to manage things from there. Uh, but cloud engineering truly in this new net world that we've had to work in in this forced virtual collaboration is really the application of software develop, development across all of these teams and all of these motions from app development all the way through the infrastructure component. It also means that we need to fundamentally integrate these teams as one and that uh, we need to find the common language to speak across what app developers really need and how infrastructure and, and ops people really need to work. So all of these three areas of infrastructure, SREs, and app dev really need to be one unified system to, to be optimized and working particularly in this new hybrid environment we'll continue to work in. So this hybrid multi-cloud app-centric infrastructure, it was trending prior to the pandemic. It's certainly on the rise now, uh, post-pandemic. Um, and you know, really, you know, understanding that you, you need to be able to have some consistency in how you manage a mixed mode where you are likely going to have uh, on-prem as well as cloud uh, and being able to go in between those two modes in a seamless and secure and performant way. Uh, quick stat for you in 2024, 50% of network operations teams will be required to re-architect their network wiring stack due to the impact of hybrid networking, which will significantly increase about 20%. Uh, and so uh, there's just a, a huge growth and trend around this multi-cloud and app-centric and hybrid world that we live in. And again, going back to this, this concept of cloud engineering, you should really think about cloud engineering as a practice for future-proofing what you do. Um, today, uh, it often makes sense for particularly small startups and small projects to start in the cloud. It's the most cost-effective way to get going uh, because you don't have to you know, build anything on-prem. You don't have to think about the ongoing costs of owning hardware yourself. But you know, as your business picks up and grows and has much more complex needs around international presence, you know, required to scale, having geospecific needs, you may need to really prepare for that mixed model of both cloud and on-prem. Or perhaps you did start on-prem from way back when and you need the flexibility of being able to do multi-cloud as well. Having that optionality and that flexibility to do that is super important. But as developers and as cloud engineers specifically in that practice, we need to think about that as early as possible. And for those who are starting new projects, that means from day one of that project, because you don't want to end up wasting time in the middle of peaks such as the pandemic, having to re-architect things to fit that scale and need. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some scenarios around that. So we've seen some businesses that were really set up for success. And the ones that use infra, what, this concept of infrastructure as code to deploy the infrastructure had the best setup because they could quickly pivot between public, private, cloud, and on-premise deployments. So what is this infrastructure as code thing? It's really using machine-readable definition files for managing and provisioning data centers and cloud deployments instead of using physical hardware configuration. This was especially important last year when teams needed to reduce high-touch environment interactions. Great open source examples of this are Terraform and Pulumi. Uh, so let's look at an example where infrastructure as code was used to help higher education. The oscillation between on-site, particularly remote, and fully remote education has created a particularly challenging scenario for colleges and universities, and I'd say also high schools and middle schools. Um, and let's say we have this university that needs to go fully remote learning. They have already used automation to expand the scale as far as they could with their on-prem resources. Now they need to move some of those workloads to public cloud to scale their offerings virtually. 
um, you know, the university infrastructure as code solution like Terraform, like Terraform to automate the deployment of your applications, both on-prem with Intersight Kubernetes service and in public cloud so they can easily customize their automation to shift the workloads. And here, I asked a colleague of mine to do a quick screencast recording for you, Kareem, to walk you through this example. As we move to cloud environment, whether that's private or public cloud, we are predominantly dealing with API-driven infrastructure, which means we can treat our infrastructure as code. What I'm about to show you is how easy it is when treating your infrastructure as code to deploy and configure a Kubernetes cluster in AWS using Terraform. A couple of key components before we get started. First of all, versions. This Terraform file essentially defines the providers that are needed for us to deploy that Kubernetes cluster. Next is our defining our EKS cluster itself. And this is where we uh, give our cluster a name. Uh, we go in and look at the different worker groups and the desired capacity for each. In this case, we have two worker groups, one with three capacity and one with uh, two capacity. Next is our VPC. And this is where we define our underlying network for our Kubernetes cluster. In this case, we're defining our private subnets, our public subnets, and what we're going to leverage from a networking underlay. Security group is next, and this is where we're basically saying this traffic is allowed to come in on port 22, on this IP address, or this IP range, and or out on these ports, right? So allowing that security uh, group management for it to be deployed in AWS. And finally, defining our actual Kubernetes cluster. What is it going to be called? And um, basically putting it all together. Okay, so now that we have this, we have all the puzzle pieces, let's all let's put it together. So we're gonna initialize this to make sure that we have all of our libraries in place before we get to deploy. So we're gonna type in Terraform init. Let's make sure, make sure that we have all the dependencies uh, ready, all the providers are ready. And then let's look at our plan. So Terraform plan, and this is essentially gonna Give us the plan that we're gonna we're about to execute. It just gives you an idea of what the endpoints are, what we've defined essentially in our entire different pieces that we covered, and then let's initialize this or let's run this. Apply, and just like that, it's gonna go out, build out my Kubernetes cluster based on what I've defined, and it's gonna take a couple minutes, and we'll come back and see it. And just like that, we have a Kubernetes cluster, which we can leverage to essentially containerize our application and deploy our application in cloud. Let's look at what we have. First of all, let's have let's update our kubeconfig file with the latest instance here. And let's go ahead and look at what we've created. So these are the nodes that were created. And let's look at everything under, we're leveraging kubectl here to, to talk to the instance in AWS. And just like that, we will have all of the information. Here's my cluster IP. I can start accessing that cluster. I can start containerizing my application and deploy my application in cloud. Thank you for joining me. And thanks to Kareem on that. So, we talked a little bit about infrastructure as code. I'd encourage you to explore this some more uh, because this is really part of the modern world of application development in a hybrid cloud scenario. So 2011, I'm sure many of you remember this catchphrase, which was software is eating the world. And this is where businesses of all kinds became software companies. And in fact, even banks like back in 2011, the fact that banks were also publishing APIs and becoming software companies was a huge feat, an incredible shift and change in how we looked at software and who offers software and who offers APIs. 
And, uh, you know, this quote from Mark Andreessen is a phenomenal, which is, you know, Amazon, I still remember those days when Amazon was just selling books and then they expanded to sell other things. And then they expanded to become a cloud provider, exposing some of the service that they were depending on for their own uh, retail business. Um, and so, you know, all of this was happening alongside, you know, Comparing Borders, which was a, a book company that also was selling books online and was, you know, thrashing the throes of bankruptcy as Amazon was accelerating and reinventing itself. So software was really, truly eating the world in this case. And yet now the catchphrase um, and the, you know, even prior to the pandemic is really that software uh, that software eating the world, now AI <laughs> is eating software. That sounds a little scary. So this was a, uh, a, a title uh, by a, a Forbes uh, author who wrote an article around this. And, you know, really AI, you know, was trending up in terms of adoption, in terms of number of jobs that were out there and the demand around that. And that actually accelerated quite a bit in the middle of the pandemic for a variety of reasons. And you know, one of those scenarios in which AI is, pick, is picking up in terms of adoption is in our own coding as developers. And so there's a very popular tool that maybe some of you, some of you are using called Tab9. And that is using uh, AI that it trained on over 2 million files from public repos in GitHub across multiple programming languages. So it's trained to learn these complex behaviors and then is able to use that deep learning to auto-suggest time-saving code completions. I mean, I did code completions with those dev tools at Microsoft way back when, but those were really simple <laughs> code completions. This is like a massive amount of uh, repetitive code that can actually be used to save you a ton of time as you're building your solution. And, you know, the whole concept of AI can seem scary, especially if, like me, you watch way too many sci-fi flicks. I get it. I, I can completely relate. Um, and while AI can help with sort of this repetitive coding, humans really are still necessary to solve really complex coding challenges. And as technologists, really, we need to also ensure that we don't inherently train our AI with our human biases, right? And so there's a significant, really significant social responsibility we all need to think about as technologists um, and that we need to take account for, especially when AI is applied to areas like criminal justice. I'm sure many of you have seen some of the erroneous identification of people uh, using AI in the news while we were all sort of, uh, sheltered in place during the pandemic. So these are the things that technologists, we should really take to heart as part of our social responsibility, ensuring we don't inherently train AI with those kinds of biases. AI is everywhere, and AI is certainly everywhere at Cisco. And I'll just walk you through just a couple of these uh, four scenarios that we have here on the screen. Um, and MindMeld, which is such a geeky, cute name, I love it. It's a technology um, that we use to support conversational AI. Uh, we developed this Python-based machine learning framework, um, and teams across Cisco use MindMeld for a variety of uh, natural language applications, such as chatbots, interactive voice response systems, and automated FAQ answering. As you know, it's uh, not a fun thing to always be doing. So, uh, and uh, as well as search. So we have applied this in products like WebEx, and we also use it for our internal and external web portals. We also use machine learning to define and apply security policy in a multi-cloud environment. So whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, these compute instances could be virtual machines, bare metal servers, or containers uses machine learning, behavior analysis, and algorithm, algorithmic approaches to offer a holistic workload protection strategy. So this allows customers to proactively identify security incidences using behavioral analysis and reduction of attack surface by identifying software-related vulnerabilities. So there's just a couple of examples that are on here. I welcome you to explore that more uh, post-presentation. Uh, and here's an example of how we actually applied uh, AI, some of our AI technology, in a real world uh, scenario. So we have uh, a customer innovation project that we worked on, and we used our Meraki cameras to learn and understand traffic behaviors in a complex intersection in Sydney, Australia. 
love Sydney, Australia. I used to travel there all the time. A great place to visit and I'm missing it right now in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but this, it's using and collecting and learning from large volumes of real world data through the cameras. Uh, and was, AI was able to identify high risk scenarios and intervention opportunities, which can reduce that traffic congestion, prevent accidents and literally save lives. So that's that's a huge opportunity in terms of leveraging something like AI. And again, you know, the adoption and usage of this is going to continue to, to tick up, which means lots of great opportunities for you as developers. If you're not already learning AI, I'd encourage you to explore that more as well. And I'm sure I don't really need to talk about this much. This is in the news almost every day, right? Cybersecurity is a threat every day for us, and that has picked up enormously during the pandemic. Uh, so I'll share some of these stats with you. I mean, it's 358% uptick in malware just in 2020 alone is massive. Uh, Google registered 27% increase in phishing sites, um, and new organizations became victim of ransomware every 10 seconds, especially small to mid-sized organizations, not just the famous ones. There are often these, these issues that happen on a daily basis that we don't even hear of in the news because they're not these big famous companies or issues that are nationwide. And as a reminder of that, not too long ago here in the US, we had this cybersecurity threat uh, with, the, with Colonial Pipeline um, only a few weeks ago. And it caused a significant gas shortage in the U.S. Northeast area. And with panic buying, it became that much worse. Uh, and this hack was speculated to have been related to open security gaps through remote, remote working scenarios that we're all living through, while well, most of us are living through right now. And in fact, this remote work this past year, we have seen a significant rise in security threats globally, 76% on average, according to some reports. So it truly lands with us as developers to contain this. It's in our power to help ensure that data systems are secure. And yet I know how many of you are feeling about this. It isn't a simple ask to incorporate security in everything you do. You have to consider where data lives, what specific country needs you have, state regulations, compliance, data sensitivity, and on and on and on. It really it shouldn't feel like paying a tax every time you have to do this. It really needs to be seamlessly part of the work that we do every day. And you know we're making progress and there are things that are on the horizon that aren't too far out that we hope to accelerate and ensure that security becomes a first class citizen in all the work that we do. So while it's, it seems like a bit of a burden to secure now, there's a rise in security specific solutions and practices. We can today identify exploitations and code at runtime and collaborate on quick resolutions. Developers have an opportunity as part of their CI CD practice to use AI for source code and binary scanning to detect risky software. And app developers will be able to integrate tools in their IDEs where you're living and coding every day to secure your in-house and third-party API integrations, as well as you know, on the horizon to proactively get security guidance while you're coding in place. So that hopefully near future. And you know, I hope that you I shared some good learnings and trends here for you to consider as you're thinking about your careers as, de as developers, things that you're gonna be working on on the horizon. But if you remember nothing else from this, I want you to take a few things from what, from this, which is our work is going to stay hybrid. Hybrid is here to stay. If you aren't already starting to think about applying software best practices across your infrastructure management, you should do that now. AI is part of the future of coding, and it's, that is also here to stay and something for you to really consider if you're not already uh, familiarizing yourself with AI. And last but not least, foremost, don't forget about your responsibility when it comes to cybersecurity risk and ensuring that we're all operating in a safe, secure world, virtually and beyond. And with that, thank you for having me. And uh, I'll open up for a Q&A. 
Yeah, thanks a lot, Grace, for this uh, very inspirational, uh, inspiring keynote. Um, I think there were some some really uh, really good thoughts uh, about what we all uh, uh, all experienced in the last uh, last one and a half years. Um, yeah, let's see if there are some some questions uh, from the audience. So you said um, that um, AI will replace, or well, at least um, somehow. Um, affect how we how we're going to uh, code right um, you, you made the example of um, auto completion um, for instance and finding bugs do you think it will um, like stay uh, mostly as a supporting uh, feature or uh, can can you also envision uh, a world in which uh, the computer basically programs itself completely so I I, I, I really do believe that AI doing auto completion of code that that will take on more and more workloads over time. But for true innovations and truly complex problems, human intervention really needs to be there. So a great example of that is really ensuring that we're not inherently programming that bias. That really requires a human person to evaluate. You know, how is this actually operating? What are the you know in inherent challenges with how this is actually automating its learning and, and um, how it's uh, actually systematically profiling uh, the results of something, whether it's a person in a, a criminal analysis or whether it's you know, some other scenario like the traffic analysis. It, it's not always going to be perfect. It's going to get better and better, but it's really going to require a pair of human eyes and evaluation to ensure that we're always using the safest procedures possible when we apply technology. Yeah, Th thank you. So um, this question, um, what are your predictions for the future of data science? Ah, what are my predictions for the future of data science? That's a tough one. Uh, I think there's so much uh, greenfield opportunity in data science in general right now, and um, it's such a, a growing discipline in general, which I look at as separate from what we do as application and cloud developers. Uh, future for, for data science, I hope, becomes less complex for people to adopt and learn and for data science practice, just like the, the operational uh, piece of cloud engineering becomes an integrated, integrated and woven part of the business, whether it's with application developers or the, the business leaders and managers who want the, the data analysis. That needs to be a much more seamless piece of the puzzle. Uh, so I think we have a ways to go when it comes to data science and how that the tools are done, how the analysis is done, and how the practice is run, so that it's much more uh, woven as a uh, everyday piece of the work that we do and as a seamless part of the, the team environment as well. Thank you. Oh, there's one more question. Um, how can developers better mitigate security risks in their code? How can developers better? So there are the, the ways that you can do that now is mostly runtime based using tooling, right? To identify those those uh, risk factors. Um, and the, the future should be really, you know, again, going back to the, it shouldn't feel like a tax. Having integrations within the IDE, whatever flavor of IDE that you use such that it becomes this helper tool in place as you're coding, identifying the risk issues while you are coding versus after the fact. It's great that we have tools now to identify um, risky software, risky libraries that you might be including, but that's often so far down the line that it's harder to undo what you did. The earlier that you can identify the issues as you're coding as part of the practice, the better off you will be. I think we're still working on getting there, but we certainly at least have tools. Cisco has a bunch of um, tools as well that help you identify some of these issues at runtime mode and deployment mode. And one more question. Um, what is the importance of open source? Um, you you gave, made, uh, made the example of uh, GitHub. Uh, so what's the importance of open source for the uh, ability to build AI code tools? Ah, so there are, there are a ton of uh, solutions and tools and libraries that are being contributed in an open source manner, which is a fantastic and is a community-driven thing, which 
it helps to really accelerate innovation. I'm a big, big fan of open source. Um, and therein, you know, where I said we all have a social responsibility, every time we contribute to libraries like that, every time we, we look at and leverage these solutions, we always need to take the approach of being a responsible technologist and understanding what is what is this really giving me? How is this really operating? And making sure, like I said earlier, that we aren't inherently putting in biases that will operate against you know certain you know factions of society and, and, and different cultures. Yeah. Plus, I guess it's also a good uh, uh, learning set for, for, for all these IA algorithms, right? Absolutely. It's a great learning opportunity, all the code that's contributed in open source repositories like GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket <laughs> and all the things. Yeah, hopefully it uh, makes the right inferences from, from, from all that code outside out there. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions um, now. So yeah, thanks again for your for your uh, amazing keynote uh, for answering all the questions that we had. You're welcome. And, um, for having me. It's a pleasure.